And it's <laughs> on. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me back up. Ted is the uh, is a good friend of ours. Uh, he's uh, a member of the IFMR <laughs> here in uh, Cummings, Georgia. And Ted and I've ridden together now a few times over the last three or four years. And in fact, he's been quite a nice fellow to host me in his house uh, several times now. Um, Ted, I've I've observed his writing techniques when he's leading or helping to lead a group, uh, and I think they've been great uh, techniques. And so I asked Ted if he'd be willing to lead a discussion tonight. Uh, I've asked him to prepare some some basic uh, presentation about uh, ride courtesy or leading and, and participating in groups, and then we'd open the floor up to questions and such uh, at that point in time, questions or other ideas that the rest of you have to share. And uh, Ted is currently president-elect of your club. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, Jerry. All right. And so we have with pets my, this weekend. Pets is this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> well, very good. I wish you the best on pets. With that, oh, and for those of you who might not know, uh, pets is the president-elect training seminar that really sponsors to tra train our leadership as new leaders come in. Uh, Ted. If you would like to go ahead and take it away, but give me just a second. I'm going to mute everybody. And then I'm going to reopen your, your, uh, your line. Now i got to find your line. There we go. Ted? Yes, here we go. I appreciate the opportunity to you guys see you all on the screen here this is pretty cool how about now am i there can't hear them okay everybody's muted but you can hear me jerry i can hear you i just unmuted. Right. i see the heads nodding thank you uh as jerry said we're here in north georgia we're in coming georgia uh, Georgia, the northern part is quite a few mountains. If you see behind me, that's the mountains. Some of the highways around here you're probably familiar with. Uh, the Churahala Parkway, uh, the Dragon Tail, and the Blue Ridge Parkway starts right over here. It goes uh, Asheville all the way up through Washington, D.C. If um if I can interrupt just a second, if you all want to put your uh, screen up in the upper right corner, there's a possible uh, a way to hit speaker view, and it'll bring Ted up in full screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, why don't you exit this? Or you can leave it either way. So we live in a great area. Uh, in our particular county, Rotary is is very highly thought of. We have five clubs in Forsyth County. We have about 300 Rotarians. In talking with the other Rotarians, we discovered that there were about 10 or 12 of us that rode motorcycles. Uh, so we started doing some short rides together. We had our first overnight ride. We decided we wanted to go to this place in South Dakota called Sturgis. So uh, back in 06, we put together North Georgia Mountain Riders uh, and made that journey. Since then, my wife and I, Karen, have been out uh, three times to Sturgis. Uh, there's a picture of my bike. Is that showing in the background? No, you haven't shared your screen yet, I don't think. All right. We're, we're seeing you in the map. All right. There we go. How about that? There you go. So it's not a Gullwing, but it is a Black Harley. Uh, and between that and the other bikes I've had, I've Pushing about 100,000 miles now. But just like in Rotary, you want to be involved with people that you know, that you like, and that you trust. So we, we designed our motorcycle group here in North Georgia Mountain Riders, a lot like a Rotary Club. Uh, even our application looks very similar to that. We require uh, our new members to uh, have three visits with us. They've got to go through an orientation. And then they got to do a uh, self-ranking of how they ride and do a checkout ride with us. What we didn't want to do was be part of a meetup group where we're just a 
a group of people showing up to ride and you don't know who you're riding with, how they ride, uh, that's not what we we're interested in. We're looking at building friendships and building relationships with other riders. Okay, so you're seeing our application and how we check people out. We do ask them to rate themselves on a one to five scale uh, on their riding ability. One thing that, that we did look at is we did make our group very inclusive. If you go to some of the other groups, I'll, I'll pick on Harley as an example. They have their Harley owners group, uh, which is exclusively Harley, but they do some things that, that we just weren't comfortable with. Uh, we went out on a couple of rides with them. Once you go to lunch, after lunch, everybody breaks apart individually and goes home. And there's a couple of times you have new riders, they may not even know how to get home. So we build our group where we protect our group. We ride a little different and that's part of why we do an orientation. Uh, up here, we have so many curves that when we're riding, we do two things pretty standard. Uh, if we go into a, a series of curves, the street sign has two curves on it, like your typical S sign. We're automatically single file. The other thing we do that's a little different, uh, technically it would be called parading without a permit. If we're in a group of let's say 10 or 12 bikes, we come to a four-way intersection. We wait until the last bike stops. One of our riders will pull up and actually block the intersection. And we'll move through as a group. Uh, that way the group stays together. We don't have people getting mixed up back and forth. And once we're through the intersection, we go single file, that rider that blocked the intersection now comes up on the inside left lane, still in our lane of travel, back to the front of the group. So some things like that are a little different. You won't see all chapters riding that way, but it's worked out pretty well for our group. Uh, we started out basically with our first overnight ride. We did a couple of one or two night rides. Uh, those worked out pretty well. Most people that we started riding with weren't comfortable going for a three, four, five, or even a week or two week ride. That was beyond their experience level. So you guys all ride a lot, but I think the entry level rider that we're talking to, if we're looking to grow IFMR, is gonna be the person looking for that one or two night ride, or even you know an extended full day trip. Um, Couple of groups that might be a target rich environment for us. Uh, obviously within our Rotarian world, there's a lot of Rotarians that have motorcycles, or have licenses. Uh, we do a motorcycle safety day here in our county. They estimate about half of 1% of the population has a motorcycle. So in our area, we're about 200,000 people. There's 8,000 motorcycles in our county. Of the 8,000 motorcycles people own, about 60 to 70% of those actually have a motorcycle license. Uh, there's several other groups uh, through social media, the Facebook groups. I run a page called Ultra Classic Riders Garage. I'm right at about 5,000 members in that particular page. Uh, if you look at Southern Cruisers, there's a lot of Southern Cruiser chapters around, just to give you an idea of the other groups out there. Uh, Jerry, up in Michigan, Southern Cruisers has 13 chapters. Here in Georgia, they have 38. Texas, they have 42. Uh, and I'd be glad to share any of these links with you. What I'm finding is IFMR doesn't have a lot of public presence. If I go on LinkedIn, uh, and I put in rotary and I put in motorcycles, I find a handful of you guys, but I don't find many of us showing up there. In fact, uh, Chris, I saw him come up this afternoon, immediately sent him a LinkedIn uh, request that way. I'd be happy to discuss how we ride or why we ride that way, or any of the links where we might find additional members, um, or whatever direction you guys would like to move into. The, the thought is how we ride as a group. So why don't we present go that way first and then we'll see where we go from the direction. Okay. 
you talking about the specific mechanics of how we ride, Jerry? The, as a group, yeah. Yeah, typically we ride in staggered formation. We have a ride captain that knows the entire route where we're going. We have someone in the middle that if we do get spread out, and we use our CB radios quite a bit, and we're relaying information back and forth. And then we have a sweep that rides in the back of the group that lets us know when we've cleared intersections or if there's traffic that's trying to overtake us in the rear. I think that's pretty standard procedure. We hold that formation except when we're in those curves I talked about earlier. You've got the double S curves. Instead of signaling single file and back to double file, we typically, if you watch us ride, I have to say we look like GT racers sometimes. We're riding double file, we get to the curves, we're back single file, straight away we go back to double file. And after a while it just becomes second nature to us, but we make sure everybody riding with us that we go over those facts. Uh, basic hand signals we use, um, you know, your stop, your turn, trash or hazards in the highway. Uh, if somebody needs to take a break, we obviously uh, they can drop off at any point and the sweep, the rear rider will drop off with them and then we'll stall the group out when it's convenient, when it's safe. Occasionally we do that. You know, somebody forgets to buckle their, their helmet, somebody has a saddlebag come open, those things kind of happen all the time. But we don't stop the group right at that point. The group may be anywhere from a mile to two or three miles down the highway before we have a safe place to pull over. Uh, typically on a ride, we'll have 10 to 15 bikes. We have been surprised a couple of times. I think our biggest number was 43 in one group. Uh, that was a little bit more than we wanted to ride as one group, but we were on some two lane highways where that became a non-factor. Uh, if you've seen the police motorcycle rodeos where they're riding in the cones, several of our riders have, have been able to master those kind of techniques. In fact, our dues are $50 initially for your first year. That includes our patch, $30 on renewal. We'll credit those dues back towards any rider advanced training that any of our members want to do. So we're, we're big on the safety factor. But if we're riding on a two-lane highway that's a T intersection, let's assume we're going to make a left-hand turn. Uh, getting 15 bikes through a left-hand turn could be a little tough. Good chance of us getting broken up. Uh, myself or one of our other riders, the group's going to go left. I'll actually go to the right. I'll go about a block or wherever room's available, make a U-turn do a slow ride back to our group. That way the group can exit, complete their left-hand turn in front of me without incoming traffic merging back into our group. Uh, again, that's worked out pretty good for us. Uh, we don't do that on divided highways. We don't do that at red lights or major intersections. We primarily do that on some of these country back roads. But our whole thought is for everybody to be able to to leave as a group, maintain the group, and not have the hazard of cars cutting in and out on us. I'd say in the past 10 years, maybe once or twice, I've had an issue where a car was offended by that. Generally, cars will hold back, and they want us to get out of the way. So that's worked out pretty good for us. Um, what other questions, Jerry, do you have about how we ride or uh, I'm, I've had several of them I'm writing down here real quick. You, you talked about having groups as high as 43. Um, in my own experience, it's really tough to keep much more than 12 or 15 people together on a ride, and particularly when you go through any kind of a town with a red light. Uh, what, uh, what did you do when you, when you had the larger groups? Do you break them up into smaller groups, or what, what, what's been your inclination as you've done it? We do. Uh, if that particular group, we actually had three separate groups. They ended up riding right behind each other. So we had like three groups of 15, if you will. We had a road captain in each group. They just happened to catch up 
and be part of the one big group. Typically, even 15 bikes negotiating through can be a bit of a challenge. 10 or 12 is probably the best number to ride with. Yeah, when, when I ride or lead and stuff, it's a little hard for me to see number 12 um, unless I've got somebody on the back with a, the with a radio kind of help me count and keep track and that sort of thing. Totally agree. You're going to get stretched out even uh, regardless of what bike you ride. CB communications and 12 bikes is going to start getting sketchy pretty quick. Uh, so we have it set up if the group gets separated. We have a ride captain in the middle. Uh, let's say we're riding with 12 bikes and we get separated. We will have somebody in the middle that can take over as a ride captain right there that knows where we're going, what our destination is. I'm a big, um, big believer in pre-riding routes. Um, once in a great while, there's not, you know, you don't have that opportunity, like you're doing a cross-country trip to Arkansas or what have you. Uh, sure. How do you, how do you, have, and then you know, you get to a group like I've been also on a ride up in New York, where I showed up and they had twenty, I think twenty-eight people or something like that, and I was able to, I had the GPS system that I could upload and download, and the guy sent me GPS coordinates, and I have certain issues about that too but so i ended up leading one that i've never ridden um based on the gps world and stuff I, any thoughts on that sort of thing how how are you dealing with when you break up a group and and in terms of people that may or may not have had the right knowledge do you always have somebody that's ridden the route or what almost always we have pre-ridden the route there's a few examples like you mentioned going to arkansas we're going to nova scotia in august plenty of roads up there none of us have ridden what we'll do then is have the road captain pull out in front, maybe a third of a mile as much. And then the second, third rider are holding back. So if we need to, let's say it turns to gravel. I know you've never had that happen to you yourself. Oh yeah, where's John? <laughs> We've all had that happen. It turns to gravel or there's a hazard or we simply miss a turn. At that point, we have enough reaction time we're not right on top of that road captain. So uh, I'll have a road captain take off and actually be out of sight. I can't see him at that point where he's looking for an intersection, looking for a turn. Uh, either he'll do it or I'll do it, but we will scout ahead if it's a road none of us have ridden before. We don't want to be right up on the highway, people hitting their brakes and starting to get jammed up. So we intentionally will put a gap in the group to do that. Um, you know, anybody else, you're welcome to uh, unmike or unmute your uh, mic while you want to talk interactively here with uh, with Ted. You're, please feel free to do so if you have a comment or ideas that you've done and led. I uh, I wrote a few notes down while Ted was talking. He talked about going into single file and S curve. I will share with you, Ted, and I know Rory and Judy have been on this ride with me, as well as uh, Dave Doherty. You get into Amish country, everybody goes single file for the entire ride. Uh, generally because those uh, horse and buggies leaves a stripe of something slick in, in the one lane that you'd like to ride. Uh, we run <laughs> into that too, Jerry, not so much with the Amish, but with the bicyclist. And we go single file left lane or single file right lane, whichever uh, makes sense. Generally, it's going to be single file left lane. Uh, the times that we go single file right lane is, let's say we're on the Churro Hollow and we have some crotch rockets behind us. We'll go single file right lane and get them to go around us. Um, we've all been buzzed by those guys, and it just scares the crap out of me every time they do it. Huh. So we let them get out of the way. Um, other questions by others? And Karen was sharing a few pictures there uh, from the Blue Ridge Parkway, the Dragon Tail. One of our favorite rides thus far was the uh, Four Corners ride, the Grand Circle out west. That was Dead Horse Point out in Utah. And those aren't the highways we were riding, but 
it certainly was an amazing overlook there if you get the chance. Very cool. I'll say one other thing about our group. Uh, we didn't start it to raise money. I mean, we all do benefit rights. Uh, this picture on the screen now is the Baldridge Boys Lodge here in our county that our Rotary Club started uh, probably about 10 years ago. At our Christmas party every year, we bring those items that you're no longer using. It can be a cup holder, it can be a seat you bought that doesn't fit, and we auction those off in a silent auction. Uh, last year, we donated a little over $5,000 to the boys' home and the uh, girls' home here in our county. A lot of the boys are not released back to their families over some of the holidays like Thanksgiving. So this particular picture, we do a write-in on Thanksgiving Day and carry a, a big meal to them. A couple of turkey and dressings with all the sides. So just like Rotary, uh, you know, we're looking to give back and have an impact. Uh, our club hosts uh, Buck Jones Toy Ride. In the past that's pulled out as many as 600 bikers before. It is a police escorted ride. Recent years, it's been running about 250 bikes. Still a huge group, much more than we can manage on our own. So that's when we have uh, uh, the police escorts involved. Jerry, I'd be glad to take any questions on how we ride or where we, where we have ridden or where we plan to go. Uh, but we can also talk about how we can transfer some of this back into our rotary world and get more Rotarians involved. Um, let's let's open up sir, for ideas to share here on on how we ride and, and group rides and, and that such. Um, or questions back to you. Anybody have anything they'd like to uh, contribute? And what was the name of the group that you said you you started again? Our group is North Georgia Mountain Riders. And it's uh, on LinkedIn? Uh, you find us on LinkedIn. You can find us, uh, we have a website, northgamtnriders.com. Or just put in North Georgia Mountain Riders. Uh, most of our communication is on our Facebook page but we keep that page uh, limited to members only. We don't want it to be a public page. When we go to Nova Scotia for two weeks, we don't necessarily uh, want to make that public information. Good cars. There are some benefits to membership. <laughs> Jim? I, I, was just, I was just saying it was a good call not to announce your travel on Facebook. <laughs> you can ask you can ask Gronkowski about that. Uh, we do live in a crazy world, don't we? Yeah. So have you done any um, like training events for these riders? Uh, we do. We have a, a spring motorcycle safety day our county puts on. Uh, at the local fairgrounds, they have a road course marked out. We use that ourselves. Uh, if we have a new rider, if we're instructing a rider that's learning how to ride, or if we just need to go out there and hone our own skills. So we do, do that quite a bit. What do you use as a, a training curriculum? Um... There's two of them that we use. One is Pro Rider Atlanta. Ken Anderson runs that. He's a member of our club. Um, the other one is, uh, I can't think of his name right now, out of Florida, Ride Like a Pro. Yeah, Jerry Palladino. Yes. Uh, Scott Ford owns the franchise in Atlanta for a Ride Like a Pro. Uh, and Scott does training as well. We also have their DVDs. We loan those out to members. Uh, and then all of our ride captains, if we're riding the Churahala, we have a newer rider that is struggling with counter steering. Probably one of the biggest things that we run into. We ride heavy bikes. You're not going to lean them like you do a dirt bike. You've got to be able to counter steer 
to get these things around a corner. Somebody's not familiar with that concept, we'll take them aside during the checkout ride. Well, anytime we need to. Hey, you're riding great, but you know, here's something I learned that maybe you can benefit from as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's an ongoing process. Done it for years. That's Rory? Yeah. You were unmuted. I thought maybe you had something you wanted to ask or contribute. Uh, Jenny was just asking me if I counted his chair. I said, yeah, I've been doing it for years. You guys would never lean those heavy bikes enough to drag your foot pegs, would you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you buy a new bike, to get foot pegs to have more, have, have the uh, quarter inch back on them. <laughs> There's not many people that drag foot pegs on a gull wing. You got to leave. Yeah, we do. Up. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> my, uh, my first, my first warning is my foot when it starts brushing. Then comes the foot peg. Then comes the highway bar. Uh, I bought I bought brand new uh, Ergol threes last summer, and uh, those are the ones that raise up out of the way for the highway pegs. Unless you got your feet on them, they spring load back up and out of the way and they're flipped up. And I'll be dang if I don't have the back of those already scratched. Probably better than the pegs, better than the fairing, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, uh, do you do any motorcycle awareness training for new drivers in conjunction with the local high schools or any of the new drivers training organizations? No, we haven't done that. We have a leader program here that trains the teenage drivers. Probably wouldn't hurt to put a motorcycle awareness in there. Uh, yeah, it's, as, as a mom of a 16-year-old, you know, I, I'm um, adamant that he pays attention. Once I'm, something actually somebody told me is, uh, you know, how we play um, like slug bug or you play beer if there's a car that doesn't have a headlight. They do the same thing with motorcycles. And it teaches their kids at a young age to pay attention to when there's motorcycles on the roads. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, along that line, almost all of us have gone to LED headlights. And the further apart those headlights are, the more visible you are to people. Uh, you can see a go wing, quicker you can see a Harley. It has nothing to do with the bike, it has to do with the distance the lights are apart. So I put driving lights out on my crash bars, and I run with my the three lights on all the time. In the rear, You've seen the bikes with the smoked out tail lights. It's ridiculous. Most of us have gone to the LEDs or the LED with the turn light where you get all three lights coming on or you get the flashing uh, impulse brake light. So we, we go above and beyond to try and be seen. And I think it's been proven that motorcycle riders make better car drivers because we are more aware of our surroundings. Uh, year, years ago, Jerry, I don't, you probably weren't even in the area. There used to be a commercial that we'd see on TV in Michigan, and it was our uh, was it Secretary of State at the time. I don't remember his name, but he would go out and do this thing where he's standing out there and hold a pencil out in the distance, and he said, all of a sudden, a motorcycle would come riding out from behind that pen. Just, just kind of as an awareness thing that as you're looking down the road, all it takes is a little bit of something in your way and that bike disappears. That's a very good point. Um, There's a question there about a handout for the hand signals. Yeah, we do that. Uh, you know, left turn, right turn, those are typical, but we there's a variety of them that we use. Uh, whether there's police ahead or gas. Hello? Now, are you seeing the questions on the right hand side? I'm not seeing your screen, no. They're coming up from the group chat. The question was do we have handouts for the hand signals that we use? And yes, yes, we do. Okay. Jerry, if you'd like, I'd be glad to uh, send you a follow-up email with the handout with the hand signals and some of the links that I mentioned. That would be great because I can share that out to everybody that's watching and, and, well, actually out to the whole organization. 
when I make a, a note about the recording to them. So that would be actually, actually very good. Um, I was just gonna jokingly here real quick share my solution, you know, for being visible, of course, right? Yep. <laughs> uh, that's, that's Judy's favorite color. No comment? I thought I'm going to get in trouble. Oh, she's making comment, but Rory's got her muted. We're in good uh, shape. That's a bumblebee. <laughs> that's a bumblebee. I will tell you, though, um, interestingly enough, I think I find myself as one of those middle people or, or the guy at the end quite a bit when I'm not a leader because everybody can see my bike when they're trying to uh, find that. So as, as uh, it, is, it is quite visible, I'll say that. <laughs> it is outstanding <laughs> yeah <clears throat> Jerry Tom here <clears throat> just wanted to reiterate one of uh, the comments about a, a ride captain and I had mentioned this once before on one of our meetings but I have to stress it again I had been pressured for about three or four years to lead a ride in Colorado and we did three nights and four days and covered 14 Colorado mountain passes, each over 10,000 feet in altitude. And our last town that we were stopping in was Durango, Colorado. And I had remembered there was a place called Honeyville where I and my father used to go and we would get the most wonderful honey on earth. And it's still in business. And so I wanted to take everybody in there and have them share the wonderful opportunity to buy fresh honey and all kinds of honey at Honeyville. And we come flying down into Durango and all of a sudden I see Honeyville on the right and I do what I would have done as an individual rider. I slam on my brakes and I throw up a right arm and uh, or a left arm for a, for a right turn signal. And boy, I had riders flying by me on the left and I had screeching tires behind me and I had a lot of very unhappy riders at Honeyville. And uh, Bob Schreiner was probably the most unhappy because he had been right behind me. And uh, I got taught a good lesson about uh, paying real close attention to giving people ample notice before you do a sudden maneuver. That's all. Um, I have to give kudos to any of the ride captains out there. Because if you get to the third bike back, they're – they're just along for the ride. I will uh, share with you guys. That I think everybody makes mistakes, okay? And how you recover is a very good point. And Tom bringing that up, thank you so much. Um, you make a mistake, you miss a turn, what have you. You've got to be very slow and deliberate about recovering from it. You don't want to slam on your brakes like Tom was just talking about. And, and, you, and you've got to understand that when you're in a group, particularly group, when we come from cross country in different areas, you've got different levels of, of, of rider capability. Uh, you've got people that are totally unfamiliar with the area that they're in. You've got to, if you make that mistake and you miss that turn, there's always a way to recover safely by just passing it up and waiting until you get a good spot to turn around and come back out. Oh, I can think of probably four or five times that I've missed a turn while I was leading a ride. Uh, Judy's smiling because she's probably witnessed, what's he doing? <laughs> we didn't go there on the pre-ride. <laughs> um, and then, you know, a couple of folks <laughs> joked with me tonight about, uh, about uh, scrapes on the side of my bike or what have you. Uh, last spring we had an issue, and, and I just I think it's a good time to go back from a safety point of view in group riding to point out that uh, – two things about the issue that came up. Number one, uh, we had a guy who was worried about being late. So for a planned stop, uh, leading the ride. And he, uh, so he plugged into his GPS, uh, you know, the fastest route and, and he ended up going a route that he didn't pre-ride to cut some time off. Uh, didn't work very well because coming, going down that side road went from pavement to gravel to mud, to very, very slimy, slick mud. 
and the 13th rider of the third of the group, the guy with the yellow bike in the back, hit that stuff after everybody else went through it. It was pretty slick, and I went down. Okay, and so when you come up to that sort of thing, and you, and you come up to a spot where all of a sudden you're on a non-pavement situation, and generally in these group rides, um, when you're not dealing with uh, cross-country bikes, and you're dealing with the touring bikes. Uh, you hit that situation, and it's a surprise for you. You best stop uh, as the group leader, and you better come regroup and figure out something different to move on from and not put your riders at, at any kind of risk for that. As an individual rider, the thing I did very wrong was not stopping on my own, you know, with that. Um, you know, regardless of how many other bikes made it through in front of you and that sort of thing, the, uh, the situation can deteriorate really fast. And, and you could be the odd guy that has problems. Or, and, and I was real lucky. I, I got up, I walked away. In fact, I really didn't have that much damage. I didn't have serious damage to the bike. I was able to ride it home for 700 miles, so, um, which was quite a shock. Uh, so just to, to tell you, I think a good point on this is, number one, when those errors come up, everybody makes errors. Don't worry about it. Stop and do the right thing, not the cover up, let's recover really fast thing, okay? And number two, um, be responsible for yourself, even when the whole group is able to do something else. You gotta ride your own ride, that's for sure, Jared. Uh, if, if I might add to that, a lot of the roads we ride, Highway 28, Chirahala, Blue Ridge, we've ridden it end to end. But before you go on a ride, almost all of them will have postings if there's construction, if there's a detour, if there's anything <laughs> going on. Highway 28 and those S curves around Lake Fontana has a landslide right now. You can't get from Bryson City to Deals Gap. The road's closed. So you gotta go around through Robinsville. You check your route, even if you know where you're going, even if you've ridden it a hundred times. You know, you guys get the uh, weather up there more than we do. You gotta double check those things for sure. Yeah, we did. We did uh, the, the Iowa ride last year, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin ride last uh, fall. And you know, I'd ridden that area a number of times in my life. I uh, did a pre-ride a year ago with Rory and Judy. I did another pre-ride later on. And sure enough, about three months later, we come to the ride and the bridge is gone. And there's a bridge <laughs> out of one of the roads. And, and now everything changes real fast. But uh, that happens. It happened when I led the uh, ride down there in Georgia for the international uh, ride after the convention. And same sort of thing. I rode it two weeks before, come back, and now there's road construction. There's something else changed. So yeah. those things do happen. And again, the key is not to, not to react quickly, but to take your time, move on, and then regroup and, and set up a new plan and, and uh, move forward cautiously and confidently. Jerry, can I respond to two questions here? You betcha. One is a mobile map app that has a group ride functionality. Oh. Uh, I use a GPS. I have a Garmin, just a basic one. Uh, Karen's got the Zumo. I don't know of a good app for mapping motorcycle rides because they're either going to go shortest distance or fastest ride. You know, what we typically do is pick where we are, pick a destination, and then do the rubber band movement back and forth to plan our route. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Maybe somebody else does and they'd like to comment. I was, uh, I was Googling while you were talking. There's an app out there that Polaris has that is, it, it was originally made for off-road riding, um, but it has a group ride functionality where someone can be assigned as the leader and then everybody else joins their group, and then it allows the leader to see where everybody else is um, on, a, on a map in case you know somebody gets lost or if there's some kind of split in the group. So I pasted the link in there to the iTunes just if one, somebody wanted to check it out. I haven't used it. I was just curious if anybody had used something like that. Does it communicate through your cell phone, I guess? It does, and so that would be one, one restriction, right? If you're out in a pretty austere area, you're not going to have cell service, and it would be it'd be, uh, you know, not as useful. I'm just thinking, you know, in the Army, we did Blue Force tracking. This is what we did, right? Like, I could tell you where everybody was at any point in time, friendly or not. And um, it seems that like something Karen. like that would be. Karen's retired Army. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I can't hear you, Karen. Sorry. She said her group in the Army fielded the Blue Force tracker. <laughs> we appreciated that. Thanks. <laughs> uh, the second question that came up was about our Nova Scotia trip. Uh, in a nutshell, we're going to uh, ride or travel or trailer to Albany, New York, cut across Vermont, New Hampshire, come out in Maine. So Rockland, Rockport, Rockland, go up the coast, take the ferry over to uh, Nova Scotia, and then do the Cabot Trail, and then wind our way back. Uh, that's a good point about double checking your ride. One of the ferries is not operating this year. So we're actually going to cross the Bay of Fundy on a ferry, and from what I hear, they have 54 foot tides. So, uh, We'll see how that works out. How long are you gonna take? Uh, 13 days from Albany out and back. So it'll be two, three days getting there, somebody's riding in. Uh, be glad to send you the itinerary if you'd like to see where we're going. Have you been in that area? No, but I'd love to go. I gotta work, so. <laughs> work can wait. Yeah. I'll tell I, my I boss. Agree. I've ridden the Cabot Trail twice. I love that road. It's uh, like riding the Blue Ridge only with the, the ocean right out there. Wow. wow. We're, we're really looking forward to it. We plan about three days in that area. You can't get around it in three days. You need one day, what we hear, just for the Cabot Trail. You do. And that might be a push. We'd appreciate any insight on that. He addressing one of the other things out here. Glenda, where are you at in Ontario? <laughs> I'm gonna hit you on mute there, dear. I am uh, Bruce Peninsula. Bruce Peninsula. Yes. Well, let me introduce you to Bruce Patterson over on the other side of the screen over here. And Bruce, maybe you could send a private message to her about uh, some of the writers and stuff around there, if you wouldn't mind. Perfect. <laughs> Are you in uh, IFMRNA, Glenda? Yes, I am. Yeah, we have a we have a number of people I've ridden with uh, around there. At least uh, at least probably eight or nine different people. Actually, more than that. We had more than that on the ride Bruce pad here a year ago. Thank you, <coughs> Bruce. If you would give her a contact through message or something, maybe. Sure. Um, I'll see if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> There's a chat button on there. Just go to chat, and then you can pick who to chat to and send that over. And if not, if you two don't get introduced to each other, Glenda, send me an email, and, and uh, I'll follow up make sure you get some details. Thank you. Other uh, comments for Ted or comments to the group about uh, writing? With, uh, I mean, group writing? Very interesting. Well, Ted... I want to thank you a ton for coming on board with us tonight and sharing these ideas and, and, and leading this discussion for us. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to do it, Jerry. And uh, for the rest of you, we do uh, intend to have these uh, sort of uh, discussion sections once a quarter. They'll be sponsored by our uh, Rotary Club here, and uh, we'll do it in a similar manner as we're doing here. The uh, and the we have ideas for two other um, of these presentations now, and and I don't necessarily have an idea of who to ask to be our discussion leader uh, for them. So if you have, um, well, let me just share the two ideas. One I would like to have is one on ride planning. In other words, what you do in terms of the sequence of putting together a two-day ride for a group to come together with, and and there's a number of us that have done that, and I think we'd like to share those ideas. Uh, to make it easier on others who would like to lead a ride or put a ride together for others. Um, that's, uh, I'm open to ideas of people to suggest to be our leader uh, for that discussion. Uh, and I kind of hope that would be our next one here in a couple, three months from now. Um, the other one we've talked about, Chris and I have talked about, is uh, doing one on uh, GPS usage. And, you know, that comes into some of the things that we had talked about a little bit here. Uh, that Amanda brought up. So GPS and, and tracking type ideas. And so 
Uh, again, I'm open to ideas of who would be a good group leader for that. And then the other thing I'm open is to other ideas that you'd like to see in these quarterly sessions uh, for, the, for the IFMR North America, uh, these, uh, these type of discussions. And I'm open to all sorts of ideas you think that benefit the group, uh, either writing or the organization as a whole, to hold these discussions. Um, don't have to come up with those ideas right here today. I'd appreciate them in email because that would help us uh, keep a record. Um, with that, anything else anybody wants to share about anything associated with the club or, or the organization IFMR? All right, I'm gonna stop the record button here. And so the system can start processing.